I'm with the astronomy department here at Yale, and today I'm going to tell you about life, the universe, and everything. Or really mostly just the first two. Um, so why? Why am I doing this? Why am I here? Why did I get into science? <laughs> so going back to like what Kimmy said, right? The thing that really um, captured my imagination about science is this idea of fundamental truths. When you, this science is based off of these fundamental truths. That are, just, that are just always right. And so if you understand how to use these fundamental truths, then you get to be always right, and no one can tell you you're wrong. And so I really love physics for that, right? Because we have like Newton's laws of motion, or like the law of gravity, and we know that they're right, and we know that they're right anywhere in the universe. So that gets us actual physics. And we can look out to the stars and do just crazy amounts of science with it, because we know these fundamental truths to be right. And if you look at biology, it's actually very similar. We have it based off of chemistry, like Amy was telling us about, like the elements, the protons, the neutrons. We understand that part. And so even though we only have this one example of life that we see on Earth right now, because we understand these fundamental truths that build it up, we can look out into the universe and consider what other life might be elsewhere and find it. So there I am in lab. And I want to find life elsewhere, right? I want life to be made on more than just Earth. So I'm trying to make life here. So what do you guys think? Raise your hand. Do you think life is like super easy to make? Anyone? Anyone? All right, thank you. We have a few optimists in the room. Thank you. Well, so let's see what you think after this talk. Um, so life is really complicated, right? You look around and it looks crazy. You see a towering tree. It's just, it kind of like awes you. But actually, life is really only made of four simple elements. So we have hydrogen up here, right? It glows all pretty when you light it up like that. We have carbon, um, which is found in coal, it's found in the lead in your pencils, and it's found in nearly every single molecule in your body and any living thing you see. Uh, we have oxygen, which we breathe, which is pretty nice, and it's made by nice trees like this, right? It's also a crazy reactive element, so another thing that's good is that it gets into all these um, chemical reactions, so it's also what lets trees catch on fire, things like that. Um, and we also have nitrogen, so you might have seen like when scientists want to look cool, they like pull up liquid nitrogen and they make ice cream with it. So these are the four elements that make up all living things that you see anywhere. Just these four, mostly. I think 99% of all living things are just these four elements. So what, what is life though, right? Like if we want to find it, we kind of need to know what it is. So I found this definition on the internet. It says, the quality that distinguishes a vital and functional being from a dead body which I feel like is just saying, well, it's living if it's not dead. And they're, they're not wrong, but they're not, they're not really doing a great job either. And this is, this is Mary Webster, right? Like, I couldn't, I couldn't get any higher than that. <laughs> and so, when we're talking about it in science, what we try to do is that it's had this working definition of life, where it doesn't cover every single thing that could possibly be life, but if something does fulfill these requirements, we can call it life in a scientific sense. And so NASA has come up with this working definition of life that comes in two parts. One, a self-sustaining chemical system. So that means that it's something that's capable of creating energy and putting out the reactions that you need to be alive and like do jumping jacks and like give talks that makes people like yourself. Um, and it's also capable of Darwinian evolution. So this means that you have offspring, right? And they evolve in certain ways. And so that life can proliferate, spread around, and get better. So I'll cover these two independently and talk about how like, we kind of do it here on Earth and maybe why it's reasonable to expect that you would do this um, outside, out in astronomy too. So first, we want, I want to introduce you to this concept of amino acids. Uh, this is an amino acid. It's defined by having this blue amino group over here, this red carboxyl group over here, and this green side chain. So you can think of an amino acid as like a charm bracelet. And so the charm bracelet has these center uh, carbons, right, that hold it together, and a blue group and a red group on either side that links it up. And then it has the side chains are like the cool charms that you get to pick off of it. And so it makes every single amino acid special and cool, right? And then when they link up really, they link up together to form really long chains. And then they fold up in these crazy configurations and they make proteins. So that's the end goal here. We want to make these proteins because proteins. They're just like kind of the best. <laughs> Proteins do everything for you. So they do transport. So here's, here's this little guy. He's a protein. He's actually like moving something in yourself from like one side to the other. They can do that for us. Um, they help cell, cell signaling. It's how cells talk to each other. 
And so over here is the boundary of a cell, and that's a protein, that's a protein, that's a protein, that's a protein over there, those are proteins, those are all proteins over there. <laughs> proteins are everywhere, they're great. Um, and we also have the structure. So we have a spider web here, and the spider web itself is actually all made out of proteins. Your hair, proteins. Your nails, proteins. So proteins are everywhere. But the best thing about proteins, and I saved it for last, is that they can act as enzymes. And enzymes are just so important. <laughs> what enzymes do for us is they take the chemical reactions that you need to make life, that like, generate energy, and they make them possible on time scale that you need for life. And so if we didn't have enzymes, nothing would tick. You would just be like a toy without battery. Um, so I have a picture here. Oh, no. Okay. I have a picture here of an enzyme that is probably like hands down the best enzyme. This enzyme takes a reaction that would otherwise take a hundred and million years to occur. And it lets that reaction happen 40 times a second. And so that's the kind of scale we're talking about. If every time you needed to take a breath and do a reaction, it took 100 million years, you'd be pretty bad at life. <laughs> but because we have these enzymes, we're much better at it. So if you want life, you want something like proteins. You want something like amino acids to help you do the living thing that you do so well. <laughs> so that's what these two guys, Miller and Yuri, were thinking about when they did this experiment. So. They wanted to see how life arose here, and then we could have a better idea of how life would arise elsewhere. So what they did is they set up these testings. Okay. Um, they made it kind of like Earth in that they made they filled this bowl with gases that you would think would be on earlier. They put a hypothetical ocean in this tube down here, and then they evaporated the water so that it would travel up these tubes, interact with the atmosphere. They threw in some sparks because we think there was a lot of lightning back in early Earth, and also it just it makes for a colder story. Um, and then, so the water interacts with the lightning in the atmosphere down here, and it falls down, and it condenses in this tube down here. So they set it up, they just they put some water, and they put some gas in a test tube, right? A completely clean test tube. And they went home for the night. And by the next morning, when they came to work, the water had turned pink already. Within a week, they stopped the experiment, they took out the water, they took, took a look, and they had found, made over, over 20 amino acids just by putting water and gases in a tube. Further evidence, this is a picture of the merchants, a portion of the merchants in New York, which you can actually see at the Peabody Museum here. The merchants in New York is like every astrobiologist's favorite rock. Like, ask anyone. We love this rock. <laughs> and there's a few reasons we love it so much. One, it's, it was like huge. So it fell from space, right? And it was huge. The entire Merchants of Meteorite was over 100 kilograms. 100 kilograms is the average weight of an NFL linebacker. <laughs> because it was so big, like everyone saw it falling out of the sky, right? And so people found it right away. They collected it and they knew it was clean. So the things that we find on the Merchants of Meteorite, more likely than not, came from space instead of uh, from Earth. And on the Merchants of Meteorite, they found over 70 amino acids. So we know we need proteins for life. We know we need amino acids to make proteins. And we know that amino acids are so easy to make, like a rock could do it, right? So <laughs> sounding a little easier now, right? But that's only half of the picture. This is the self-sustaining chemical system side. We still need to consider this idea of Darwinian evolution. And to introduce that concept, the way we do it here is we use, oh, no, okay. We use RNA and DNA. So these are like, instruction manuals in our cells, and they, they code up uh, the characteristics that we have. They decide whether you have black hair or brown hair, and they decide whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes. We, we get it from our parents. So your parents kind of look like you, you kind of look like your parents, and in that way it's passed on and light and spread. But it's not, it's not perfect. So DNA actually can change through mutations or something we call recombination. And so that way, um, you have different DNA than your parents slightly. And if your DNA is better, so you could be better at living than your parents, um, then you, you stick with that DNA instead, and that way life can get better and better as you evolve. And that's what we call Darwinian evolution. So in this, uh, in this example, right, this, this poor spotted deer down here, he's eating the grass, but he has this, ch this child who has a completely long neck. And so if we extrapolate that further and further, this deer becomes a giraffe that can eat from the tallest trees. And so that's why Darwinian evolution is important for life because we get very variations of life that can do different things. So, working definition of life, we have our self-sustaining chemical system, we have our amino acids that make proteins that give us the chemical reactions that we need. And on Earth, we have the capacity for Darwinian evolution because we have this RNA and this DNA that 
uh, the chain that can be mutated uh, and give us our winning evolution, right? But then it seems, it seems like we're kind of stuck in a pickle, right? Because we need the proteins to make the DNA, and we need the DNA to tell us what proteins to make. So, so how do we get around this? Because it seems like we need two different things, right? And the answer is ribosome, which is the ribosome, which is this huge mass of activity here. And the ribosome helps translate DNA into proteins, and the crazy, so it acts like a protein in that way. But the crazy thing about it is that it's not made like a protein at all. It's actually made mostly of RNA. So before I was telling you that proteins needed from amino acids, I lied just a little bit, but it's okay because I'm telling the truth now. Um, <laughs> So it's made entirely out of RNA. This lets us have this model called the RNA world, where right now, right, we have the DNA, it has the instructions manual. The RNA tells the world, the rest of the cell, what that instructions manual is saying, and it makes protein that does, goes out and carries the function. But then we discovered the ribosome, and we learned that since RNA can encode genetic material just like DNA, it can write the instructions manual. It can read it for you. And it can go out and carry the functions that protein can just like it does in the ribosome. And so because this just, it just fits together so perfectly, this is how we think life probably originated on Earth. It started out as RNA and then progressed into cells and things like that. Um, the other thing we know about life is that it requires water to maintain these chemical reactions for three main reasons. Water is, a is called the universal solvent. It's really good at dissolving different particles. And once the particles are all swimming together in the water, um, it's much easier for them to react and do the reactions that we need for life. We know that water has a high specific heat, which just means it's hard to change. So we have a picture here of a cat washing a pot, and we just, we just know that a pot's not going to boil because when you wash a pot, it doesn't boil. And the reason for that is because water is so hard to change. It takes more energy to raise the temperature than it would of other material. And so when we, if we are living in water, it's a more stable environment and life can form more easily there. And lastly, ice floats, um, which is great for us because then it creates this like, layer of protection and we can just hang out in the water if you need. So because water has all these great things and we know that every life we see on Earth requires water, we actually equate discovery of water with discovery of life in the cosmos because it just seems like life needs water so, so badly to live. So when we look out into space and find planets around other stars, we define this habitable zone as the distance away a planet has to be from its star in order to maintain liquid water on its surface because we think water is completely necessary for life. And so here's our sun, right? And here's the Earth. And we can see that Venus, a little bit too close, probably not any water. Mars, a little bit too far. Instead of water, they have ice. And if you have brighter stars, the habitable zone is further away because you get more energy from the star. And if you have dimmer stars, it's closer in. So for example, you guys might have heard of the TRAPPIST-1 system that was discovered recently and everyone like lost their minds about it because if you see over here the half of the Earth is right in the center, the TRAPPIST-1 system has seven planets and of these seven planets, there are three planets in the habitable zone that could have aliens thinking about looking for us right now. Even more exciting was the discovery of Proxima Centauri B, I think two years ago at this point. This is actually, this. This is actually the star system that I study because the Centauri system is very exciting because they are the closest stars to us. If we were to travel anywhere in the universe, the Centauri stars would probably be our first stop. And on these stars that are as close to us as they could be, we found a habitable planet orbiting one of them. So I study this system because I truly believe that within 10 years, we will probably want extraterrestrial life out there. So when you guys are graduating college or graduate school, you could be helping me study aliens for the first time. And I think that's a pretty good thing to do with your life. <laughs> Thanks.
and they had more energy to work with, they could have more and more cells come together. And you just take our main evolution down that road until you get plants, or you get a puppy, or you get your little brother. I hope that makes sense.